Good morning, Magic. I'm Gavin Verhey from Wizards of the Coast. And today I have on an extra special guest to talk about Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. And I'm so excited I was able to get him, even though he doesn't work on Magic anymore. But he's still an integral part of the set. Welcome to the show, Andrew Veen. Hello. Yeah, I put the X in extra special. <laughs> Very true. So Andrew Veen, or as we call him Veen simply, it uh, makes it nice and easy, used to work at Wizards and has since gone to go work elsewhere making games, but he was integral to the adventures in the Forgotten Realms set. But before we get into that, Andrew, what is your background on Magic? So my background with Magic, uh, you know, obviously starts when I was super young, played the card game forever, and then uh, had dreams of eventually making the game, and I got lucky. And I, uh, I started with an internship at Wizards working on uh, a game that's no longer produced uh, called Kaijudo, and that translated into me getting converted to full-time. The first set that I worked on was the uh, vision design of Shadows over Innistrad, and then I was on the Magic team in earnest, when I joined the first iteration of the play design team and then moved to Vision Proper, where I contributed to Baseball Vision, which became Theros Beyond Death. And then I was on Exploratory for Ikoria, as well as Vision for Ikoria. For uh, Zendikar Rising, I was on the Vision as well as the uh, development team. After that, when that didn't explode and it went okay, they were like, okay, maybe we can give you a set. Plus you like this D&D thing a lot. So why don't we hand you the reins of, uh, of AFR, which at the time was, a core set, and I thought, okay, a core set, I can handle this, and then it became so much more than that. Yeah, and this was huge, right? It's our first ever D D Magic crossover. You sit down, day one. Uh, the idea of a vision design team is you basically have nothing; it's a blank slate to start with. Where do you even begin? What do you start doing? That it was super daunting, uh, and so the. the the first thing that you have to do is collapse it down to be manageable. Like make sure that you're doing something where instead of trying to say, we're going to put all of D&D in magic, or we're going to put all of magic in D&D, like you have to make it manageable. And I took a, a, a bite of the old Mark Rosewater sandwich, and I decided to take a whiteboard and just write down all of the tropes that you would expect. So like, we didn't need to come up with source material, which is sometimes what we do to, for inspiration. We didn't need to come up with creative input like we had all of that so instead what is some trope space what are some things that you would expect the set to have uh and we started carving up uh, the creature grid and then uh the creature grid is where you take uh creatures from the setting and you put them in size by color flying and non-flying uh, and that way, uh, all across the set, you have you know when you have to make a beholder or a dragon or a bullet or something like that. Like you know where it goes uh, in the set. James Wyatt was huge with that, by the way. And then we started writing down uh, famous characters, like people we knew needed to be in the set, iconic spell names, things that were basically if we didn't check the box, we would have made a major mistake. And then we tried to say, okay, what ties these together? Like what what can we do? To, to have rough archetypes? What can we do to have rough cycles? What can we do to, to make sure that we're getting the things that need to be here and the underpinnings? Uh, and then trying to evoke in magic mechanics, major resonant themes of uh, of D&D. &D. And, and then from there, it was figuring out whether or not we wanted to do a traditional set skeleton or depart from that and do something a little bit crazier. Uh, and I was lucky where I had Jules on the team and Jules was the, you've had him on the show before, and he was the, the lead set designer on the set. So he was going to take over after Vision was done and actually construct the set. Jules and I had been on a couple of set design teams together before. And when we would be a part of uh, those teams early in set design, we would see that a lot of the Vision gets changed, not the Vision ideas, but the, the, the cards that Vision hands over change pretty drastically. Like you're you're in you're ripping out entire mechanics, putting whole mechanics in, you're ripping out entire archetypes, putting whole archetypes in. You keep a couple of cycles, but some cycles leave, you keep one or two cards. And so um because it's hard to know what cards are load bearing, what cards are important, what cards uh can go, um I didn't want to saddle jewels with a whole set of those. Instead, I wanted to make sure that he had an idea for what the set wanted to be, and then a bunch of cards for specific hits. Like we knew we were going to need a Dritz, so here's nine Dritz designs. We knew we were going to need a Beholder, so here's five Beholder designs. We knew we were going to need a couple of mechanics, so here's a bunch of mechanic backup designs, right? But instead of like handing over all 350 cards, I didn't do that. 
uh, I had a super long vision design document and a, a bunch of cards and mechanics for each slot that was important. And so the rest of the vision, the early vision design meetings were spent on coming up with like, what are the things we're actually going to deliver to set design that they're going to use instead of how do we fill in all these blanks that set design is just going to discard anyway. And because this was such a wild set, like we knew we were going to have dice rolling. We knew we were going to have new creature types. We knew we were going to have spells that were named from the, the player's handbook. We tried to make sure that we had enough variation on how to do those things that whenever they threw out something, like whenever set design had to throw something out for limited balance or for fun reasons, they would have something else to fill in the gap immediately. And then a lot of early vision was spent coming up with bad ideas for things. <laughs> so uh, we tried it. We knew that we wanted dungeons. Like it's called Dungeons and Dragons. Let's do dungeons. And we just came up with so many failed attempts at what dungeons were. Like what is a dungeon? And uh, one of the ideas we had ended up becoming the booster fun treatment of the lands where they're all the modules. It's like, well, all of the places like many adventures are named after places. Many of the famous books are named after these famous places in D&D. Maybe we should just say like Tomb of Annihilation is a land and it does this thing and it makes zombies or whatever, right? Like, let's let's do that. Uh, midway through Vision, we thought about uh, what the, the greater audience was going to think. We started thinking about what does a D&D &D player want from a Magic D&D &D set? What does a Magic player want from a Magic D&D &D set? What does a player of both games want? And what does a player who's new to both games want? The answer for each of those squares is pretty different. Like the answer for what someone who is a fan of both wants, which we thought early on that that was gonna be the hardest fan to please was the super fan of both genres. Nah, that person was hook, line and sinker in for it. They were, they were here for whatever we were gonna do and we could make them super happy. The fan of one or the other, we had to be super cautious of. Like we didn't wanna make this feel like we were crossing the streams just because it was, we could, they were both in the building. We wanna go ahead and put d, &D on a magic pack and, and throw it out the door. So we had to make sure that we were staying true to the, the game of magic that people love and that we were giving D&D uh, &D fans a treatment of the things that they care about that was worth all of their time and emotional investment. I mean, Veen, there is a lot there, so much good stuff. And a few things I kind of want to go back and dive into because we had a couple of really interesting asides that I'm like, oh, let's hear all about this. And one of those is, is first let's talk about the core set thing. So you said it was originally designed as a core set. Clearly that changed somewhere along the line. Give us the story of, of what happened there and kind of your perspective on it. Yeah, so <clears throat> uh, this actually came about because someone said, well, what if we just tried D&D? &D? Like, what if D&D &D was the core set? And that way you could take something that was uh, super resonant, take something that was awesome and iconic and people loved it, and take something that's as approachable as the core set and mash them together. It'd be a good jumping off point for D&D &D players to get into magic. It'd be a great jumping off point for magic players to get into D&D. &D. This is just a win on all on all cylinders, right? And we started designing it and D&D &D lends itself pretty well to being a core set. Like you get to have something resonant and flavorful that says like human fighter and then a bunch of flavor text and they're two, two. Like you get a whole lot done without a lot of rules complexity. And so it was very easy for us to let the tropes guide us and build a core set. Unfortunately, that didn't let D&D &D thrive to the extent that it wanted to thrive. And as we play tested more and people saw more of the set, it, uh, it became pretty understood internally that this was going to want to grow past what a core set wanted to be. It was going to want more complexity. It was going to want to engage more uh, in franchise players for longer. It was going to want a deeper draft format. And these are all things that expert level expansions do, non-core sets like the, the the main expansion sets do. And it was going to require the same amount of uh, world building for a world guide. Eventually the, the, the decree came down from leadership where the answer was just make the best D&D set you can. It doesn't matter if it's a course. If it turns out that that's a core set, make a core set. If it turns out that that's a mainline expansion, make it a mainline expansion. But don't be hamstrung by sales goals. Don't be hamstrung by marketing restrictions. Don't be hamstrung by complexity. Make the set that this set wants to be. And then Jules ran with it. It's super interesting to hear about how it moved from a, a core set to not a core set and kind of the reason why. And ultimately it totally worked out, right? We, we got to make the best D&D &D set we could, which I, I'm really happy about. So there's been a lot of people asking me, where is Party in Adventures in Forgotten Realms? It seems like such a slam dunk. You, you seem like the guy who would know the answer because you were on Zendikar, you were on Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, you were the lead. Veen, 
Give us the scoop. So uh, when I was on uh, what was diving at the time, we were whiteboarding what we needed for uh, the adventures Zendikar set. It was going to be about going back to Zendikar's roots. It wasn't going to be about the Eldrazi. It wasn't going to be about the, the war-torn world. It was going to be about adventure world again, the land rising up. And, and it was it was about the, the allies and the land. And so what we wanted to do was hit the allies in a way, brought them back. Like what I liked about original Zendikar and reading Rosewater's articles about this uh, was the fact that they tried to feel like a, a an adventuring party, like it was you had wizards and clerics and fighters. And I thought, I think we could be a little bit more explicit than that. And we had had uh, uh, bundling as uh, new technology that came with uh, Historic that came out in um, uh, Dominaria. And so I thought we could just batch this and have it be, what if it was just the four iconic classes, just fighter, rogue, wizard, cleric. And I thought, magic has those we can do that and magic really likes threshold one mechanics and really likes scaling mechanics and this was something that could be both of those it could be something that when you had one of a thing it was fine when you had four of a thing it was awesome and we could say things like if you have a full party what's your adventuring party and stuff like that so we went uh we went off and it became the party mechanic from zendikar and we were told it early in Zendikar Vision that this was going to be the D&D, the, the really the most resonant D&D set that we did. It wasn't going to be official D&D. This was going to be as D&D as we got because that's not something we planned on doing. And so I said, are we sure we're not going to do the D&D set? Because I think that this mechanic is slam dunk for D&D. Are we sure we're not going to do it? They're like, yeah, yeah, we would not do the D&D set. And so in went the party mechanic and then the D&D set came along. And when I was uh, chosen to lead it, I thought, okay, well, can we can we take the, the party mechanic? I knew that answer was going to be no because Zendikar relied on it pretty heavily and it was a solid win there for the allies. And so I said, well, can we at least have some of party and play design said well in a world where we don't have blocks anymore we just have one set we wanted to make sure that party was as impactful as it could be and so we we kind of put everything there for the party decks like everything the party needs everything the party wants everything that we want party to have is in standard now so if you want to have party you can't have anything good <laughs> you could add party but none of it can be constructed i thought well i mean I'm really not going to do that. <laughs> like I'm not going to I'm not going to bring party and say, "Hey D&D player, I'm going to give you the party cards that you want, but none of them are going to be competitive or strong." <laughs> so, uh I decided that that just ultimately was not going to be where we went. We we're going to have the creature types, of course, they would fit in party decks, but nothing that calls out the word party. Um and I heard later that uh, they actually came back, they being play design, came back to Jules and said, oh, we've actually, we've made some space. Like, do you want to put party in the set? And at the time, Jules looked at the mechanical suite of stuff that he had and thought like, the amount that I would be adding is not the amount that I think the set wants. It wants either a lot more or none. Uh, and so it, it it didn't get added in. And I think that it's better to, to know that the next time we do something like this, that party could show up or um, people have options of building party decks in Commander with the stuff that's in AFR but we didn't put any cards in that were not going to make fans happy. Like we didn't make any cards that were weak just to say we made them. I think that's a totally solid philosophy. And plus uh, one thing about parties, it takes up such a huge footprint in the set, right? To make it work, you really have to make it work. And plus when you're locked into wizards, clerics, rogues, and warriors, D&D is not just about those four types. It's got bards and it's got um, barbarians and you know monks. And it's like, well, it's kind of a bummer if we can't use these new types with it too. So. Um, I, I understand why I was excluded, but it was super interesting to hear the like actual source origin story from Zendikar all the way through D&D about how, how that happened. That's super fascinating. And then uh, I am curious, you mentioned some early dungeon designs. What were the ones that didn't work out? You mentioned the land one, yeah, but what were some of the things you tried out that were like really wild that didn't quite hit? Uh, one, of the, one of the earliest ones was um a riff on saga like we thought that like what is the closest thing to telling a DD story that magic has and so adventures are two beat stories transform cards are two beat stories sagas are actually n beat stories where n is the number of chapters they have and we thought like can we come up with a resonant adventure story top to bottom on a saga and so we came up with uh i think one of the most preposterous ones uh was Jules made the um, Tomb of Annihilation, and it was a 13-step dungeon, 13 being, you know, obviously what you want. Uh, and 1 through 12 were make a 2-2 zombie, and then the 13th step was life drain for the power of zombies you have in play, which was perfect. It was just super iconic. It was basically just Bitter Blossom for zombies, right? But uh, it also was just a very silly 
D and D card where the like you got to use a D twenty on it too to track its steps. Like we were trying to come up with a bunch of ways to use D twenties if we ultimately didn't want to roll a D twenty. We knew we were going to probably roll D twenty, but what if we didn't? We wanted to have a way to 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 use those sorts of things. This is the kind of thing where when we say failures in vision, like we're thinking about a lot of stuff all the time. I I, I been the thirteenth chapter saga. I'm just die. I'm dying over here hearing about the thirteen. It's like the funniest thing. I know I've never heard about this. It was like the funniest thing to me. I mean, it does fit so well, but just the idea of like, oh, just 13 little chapters. No, you know, it's like one through 12. One through 12. Thing. Yeah, 13. seeing one through 12 on a card really solidifies. Like there were a lot of laugh out loud moments in the set. Also, the amount of laughter and smiles that happened in those rooms, like we knew that this set was, that's that's how it became not a core set. That's how it became make the best d, &D set you can. Is like th th there was just so many people who cared so much about both properties in that room, trying to make each other smile, trying to encompass like, how do you get the feel of, you know, five of your best friends around a table laughing about a story, uh, you know, where, you know, sometimes it's scary, sometimes it's sad, sometimes it's happy, but we're all just laughing and, you know, eating chips or whatever. How do we, how do we make that in a magic set? And sometimes it's the 13 chapter socket that does it, man. Other times it's, uh, it's figuring out a way to get uh, a giant miniature space hamster uh, on a card. So amazing. Well, that, that was a fantastic story. And speaking of the D and D and magic player, one thing I did want to talk with you a little bit about is I know super early on in the process and super early vision, there was a test that was kind of done with both magic and D and D players to figure out how far was too far. And can you kind of just talk about that a little bit. Maybe we'll put some of the card images up here on the screen as you talk about them. But yeah, just talk about it a little bit and tell me um, kind of what that was like and what you were aiming to do. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Aaron Forsyth came up to Jules and I and said, we've got some consumer insights tests uh, lined up where we're gonna go and talk to people from various demographics, people who are part of that, like caught like the, the, the Punit Square of Magic players, D&D players that I was talking about earlier, where some played one, some played the other, some played neither, some played both. And we wanna make sure that we can test people and see how much magic is too much magic for the D&D player and how much D&D is too much D&D for the magic player. Uh, so can you come up with a number line of cards from the the most magic at one to the most preposterous D&D &D at 20 uh, and have it get slightly more D&D &D along the way and just see where people get off the train, see where people get off and then see where the D&D &D players hop on, like see where they latch. Uh, and then we'll try to target the set at that intersection point where we'll, we'll sway a little bit for uh, toward the magic side for some cards and sway a little bit toward the D&D &D side from others. But where's that sweet spot where we're making the most people the most happy? And it started from uh, what we considered to be a, like a guiding light in Vision and a guiding light for the set was when we, you just take Arc Lightning and you call that card Magic Missile. So 2R Sorcery, card name deals three damage divided as you choose among one, two, or three targets. That's just, it's, it's what Magic Missile does. It's what Arc Lightning does. I'm sure that Arc Lightning was originally concepted as a Magic Missile when the person designed it in the first time it was entered in a, in a Magic set. Uh, it's perfect. So if we put this in, how happy are people? Like, do people understand? Then there is uh, the iconic spell name with a similar magic function that isn't as 100% of a lock. So like we had hold person in there, which is basically the classic blue common sleep enchantment that just says you can't untap and tap when you get in there. Uh, we started in introducing creature types then when like just creature types that weren't part of magic originally like tiefling and, and warlock. Uh, then we started saying like, what if we introduce terminology like check? or a DC, right? Things that make sense to magic players that don't necessarily make sense to, or to D&D players that don't necessarily make sense to magic players. And what if the check was based on something in magic? So this was the first card that I thought was an easy take on how we might do check early on in vision. We called it constitution check and it costs a single white mana. Uh, it's an instant, it says gain two life. Then if you have 15 or more life, draw a card, which is basically like if you succeed on the check because you have a bunch of life, you get to draw a card. We had a uh, version of getting experience, but we also had half breeds. Like in in D and D, the races you can have uh, half orc, half elf, half uh, half gnome, which is a halfling. And so we put uh, for burly warrior, which was a creature dash half orc warrior, instead of it being human orc warrior, which is how magic would have done it before. We had half orc. Is this something that people would would like? And the way that he got experience was uh, whenever he's dealt damage, put a plus one plus one counter on it. Uh, and then we started to get a little bit crazy. This is when we started looking at if you really don't understand the source material, you probably should not understand what this card is trying to tell you to do. My favorite card uh, of this list that I didn't design uh, was Jules's Beholder. 
Uh, and this card is wild. So what a beholder does for people who don't know D&D that well is there it's this uh, floating orb aberration with a bunch of eyes and eye stalks and each eye shoots a different magical ray with a different effect. There's rays of frost, rays of negation, rays of exhaustion, rays of uh, de-leveling, things like that. Uh, and it's also got one main eye in the front that it looks around with. And in that eye, there's an anti-magic aura, a cone where magic does not work. And so part of the way that you can fight a beholder is to stay in that cone where its rays can't get you, but also none of your magic items work and you can't cast spells and fight it that way. But this card on first read does not make sense to many magic players. <laughs> uh, and it was uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, you picked an opponent and then creatures that that opponent got or controls gain hex proof and lose all of their other abilities until the beginning of your next turn. And then whenever the beholder attacks, it randomly shoots its eye beams at different creatures. So it taps creatures, kills creatures, or mind controls creatures, but you can't target the creatures of the player that you were attacking because they have hex proof. So it seems like the card is inherently a, a, not a combo with itself until you realize that, oh, this is clearly a multiplayer card. Like I'm supposed to choose one player to make their creatures hexproof and attack a different player uh, and blast their creatures or attack the hexproof player, but blast someone else's creatures. And the D&D crowd doesn't just think a game is two players. They just don't immediately, like the way a magic player thinks like a duel. Oh, like uh, this is 1v1, this doesn't make any sense. The 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 D&D players who had magic knowledge, because this is also a pretty hefty lifting card in terms of magic rules knowledge, um, they got it, but this, Raised some eyebrows for sure. Uh, we did critical hit on one card, Lucky Warrior. Uh, whenever he attacks, you roll a d20. If, if it's a crit, which is a, a 20 on the die, it gains a double strike. So uh, it was um, really high variance. We knew that we wanted 20s to matter, which we ended up doing with the 1 through 9, 10 through 19, 20 uh, breakdown of, of how things worked. And then we started doing uh, opponents making saving throws and opposing creatures making saving throws and skill checks, which we were hoping people wouldn't really like because that would have been a whole can of worms to open up. But like, it's something where the more rules you put in front of someone uh, that they are familiar with, the more that they uh, want to learn more. Um, <laughs> Very Heavy Maul was the first, one of the first cards I designed for this challenge. And then I put it toward the right tail of the D&D side, but it was an equipment for two. Uh, where the equipment gave power and menace, but the key line was very heavy maul can only be attached to creatures with at least 12 strength, implying a lot, implying that there is a strength scale that goes above 12, and implying that creatures will now have a list of statistics <laughs> somewhere uh, that would be a backward compa compatibility nightmare, is strength power, who knows, uh, but like, is this something that people were interested in? Is this something that would scare away magic players? Um, <laughs> <laughs> fast warrior is another excellent one it was <laughs> a french vanilla fa uh one dub two two with initiative 17. <laughs> what, <laughs> what does that mean uh does that mean that this is there is 17 first strike steps and this one deals its damage before the other 16 do <laughs> who knows uh but that got a lot of attachment, uh, but not a lot of engagement. And then another one of my absolute favorites is uh, Boss Dragon. And this was probably the favorite one that I designed. I like it almost as much as Beholder, uh, but it's it's 4RR for a 5-5 five, five Flying Dragon. So classic archetypical uh, Shivan Dragon stats. Uh, when Boss Dragon dies, turn to page 148 of the Dungeon Master's Guide and roll on the loot tam table to determine what drops. Uh, and I love that that was an accurate DM page. And I love that really made players think like, am I going to have to bring a book to FNM? Am I going to have to like get loot? What is getting loot mean? Uh, and it was basically like, there's no way that you think this card is real, right? Uh, but a lot of players did. A lot of players were thinking about like, oh, that seems fun, except it seems a little bit complicated. And I, you know, during a timed round, it would be hard to find that page and, and roll on it. And like, who rolls the die? <laughs> do, do I roll the die? Uh, do I have to have a judge nearby? And then the, the, the card with the most nonsense, this was that the end of the scale past boss dragon was uh, concealed backstab. Uh, which was uh, 2B for an instant rogue ability. Uh, the next time one of your rogues would deal damage this turn, roll a stealth check. The DC is determined by the dungeon master, of course. If it succeeds, the rogue deals plus 1D6 piercing damage. If it fails, prevent all damage that would be dealt by the rogue this turn, but it becomes concealed. Uh, and the amount going on in that card uh, that's implied about what would be true about the set is massive. Uh, and luckily, uh people were more confused about what it meant than excited 
Uh, and that's that's what we were hoping. Like we were hoping that like this would get people to to perk up and, and pay attention, but they wouldn't expect this kind of thing to, to come from the game. And it sounds like a lot came out of it, right? Like figuring out, yes, we could do creature types this way. Yes, spell names are awesome and resonant. Yes, we should have an awesome dungeon mechanic. Uh, die rolling. Okay, don't go this far. Let's not do let's not do some of this dice rolling stuff. But eh, maybe d twenty rolling is you know where you check a chart is going to be okay, right? Like all of that came out of this initial test and these twenty odd cards, right? Yeah, we did. We ran these tests uh, multiple times with multiple groups of people, and we were getting consistent re results across them. Uh, the amount that we learned from this uh, external group of people was enormous, and it influenced all aspects of vision and set design going forward. Um, architecture was involved, uh, business insights was involved. Like it was really uh, a testament to how good wizards had gotten at uh, figuring out what players want and how to, and how to test for what players want. But ultimately it was Aaron's idea to try to see like this whole spectrum was Aaron's idea. And it really gave us a bright line of what to shoot for to make the most people the most happy uh, and sort of tamper down the fear that all of us had of like, what if we do one of these two games wrong? Uh, and this this let us uh, like um, calibrate and align. One of the I wanted to ask you about Venus. So you handed a lot of stuff off, and obviously many of these things stuck through. Some things didn't. What was created after you handed the, the set off? Did, were you happy, for example, with how dungeons turned out? It sounds like those changed a lot. Were ability words there when you were working on them? What was what was kind of the situation? Yeah. So uh, there were some some winners and some losers from Vision. Uh, I would say that the thing that I was the the saddest to see go, I still can't talk about. There was something that we tried to experiment with in Vision uh, that didn't come to fruition, but I still have hopes for it and I still think it'll come out. And when it does, my team and I will be super happy and vindicated, but unfortunately the realities of shifting teams and COVID and things made it so certain parts of the set couldn't see the light of day. The, the thing that I can talk about that I'm the most sad didn't make it through was my version of experience for the set because I knew that we didn't want to do level up again. Like level up screen treatment was a little bit complicated um, and we couldn't do experience like called XP because commander had that um, for tokens on certain commanders. So uh, I came up with a mechanic that I liked a lot called milestone. Uh, and milestone is how experience is awarded in fifth edition. Instead of it being these like very um, gritty, fiddly, granular numbers uh, that come from uh, calculations after combat. After you reach certain milestones in the story or in adventuring, uh, you're granted a level. And Milestone was a combination of Renown and Inspire. And so when a creature with Milestone would untap, uh, you would put a plus one plus one counter on it up to three. Uh, the way that it could tap was interesting. Like if it was a fighter, it would attack. And instead of getting uh, the counter on Renown, it would get the counter if it lived and untapped. There's a card that uh, that was Mind Scour Adept, and Mind Scour Adept was three U for a human wizard, one one with Milestone. Whenever this creature untaps, if it has fewer than two plus one plus one counters on it, put one on it, and then it has one U tap. Target player mills X, where X is equal to the power. And so, you're, if the creature was doing its job, it was getting like job points from like a tactics video game or from D and D. Uh, it would untap and do uh, and get bigger and become better at its job. But yeah, I liked it. It was a solid mechanic, but unfortunately, it's pretty course steady. Like that, the reason it had to leave is because it didn't like we needed more complexity uh, and more room for the flavor words, which was something that we had discussed but didn't know we're going to stick in vision. That was awesome. It was so awesome to see Cure Minor Wounds, and it's awesome to see 50 feet of rope with uh, climb over and tie up. Like it, it, it really does tie together, no pun intended, what the cards are trying to do. And it's a way for us to inject a lot more tropes and a lot more spell names and a lot more things from D&D into a set that ultimately can't be a thousand cards. If you want to get everything from D&D in that you want, the set would have to be enormous. Um, the thing that I was the most skeptical of that turned out to be great was dungeon. This was the first thing that, that Jules went to look for. I thought we had plumbed the depths. I thought we had we'd scoured for what dungeon could be, and so many of the dungeon things we did were bad. And the first iteration of dungeon, which was way less clean than it is now, but it was on track, it was close to this. I thought, this is nonsense. This is preposterous. There's no way that this is going to turn out. Uh, but it was out of my hands. It was like, okay, Jules, you know, I trust you. You're a smart guy. You were on vision. You know what I know. Uh, you know, good luck. Have fun. Uh, and what he came up with was something that I would have bet against strongly. Uh, and now I look at the three dungeons uh, in a pre-release pack. I got to see three of those foiled dungeons and I look at them like, oh, wow, this is just a shiny version of your wrong right in your face. 
uh and i am so happy that he pulled it off like to have a dungeons and dragons set without dungeons and dragons would have been bad uh and i'm so glad that he found a way to do it uh where i couldn't we spent we spent a long time and uh and i i came up came up empty yeah i am also so happy we have dungeons in the set but i know that feeling right you're like i've tried i'm I, clearly there's nothing beyond the reaches of my imagination you, you know i'm the only person who could do this and, but then, you know, it turns out we have a bunch of very talented designers and different people attack problems in different ways. But also you came up with things that I'm sure Jules wouldn't have as well. It has been an amazing time talking with you, Andrew. So many great things we, we've discussed. Is there anything you want to say before we uh, take off today? Uh, just thank you to everyone that worked with me on the set. Uh, I had an amazing team. I had a ton of fun. This was a real bucket list project. Like I, I got to work on something that was super important to me. I've been playing D and D and magic for decades. And to be part of this before I moved on to a different company was really uh, a fantastic capstone. And I'm super happy that people are loving it. Uh, we put a lot of time, love and energy into this and I'm glad that it's making people smile. Have you had the chance to play with the set yet? It sounds like you went to a pre-release maybe at least. I couldn't play at the pre-release. It would have been a little unfair, but I did get to go with my girlfriend and watch her play a bit. And then we played some sealed deck when we got home. Well, that is fantastic. Well, I'm glad you got to work on the set, Andrew. It was amazing to see your handiwork come to life. Thank you for all the incredible stories today and best wishes out to you at Bungie. Your legacy on magic will live on forever. Thanks everyone for watching and I will talk with you again soon. If you have any thoughts or extra questions you want to share in the comments down below, put them down there, and I'm sure both me and Veen will be taking a look at them. Talk with you again soon, and in the meantime, may you have a lot of fun in your own dungeons. You got this. To deal two damage to swans, which draws you two cards. You'll draw more lands and, well, you get the idea. Eventually, you hit Dakmore Salvage, which lets you replace one of the draws with a land to guarantee you can keep going. This means you'll get through your whole deck, and if you find enough lands along the way, you can kill your opponent by discarding lands to assault.